The mummification process used by ancient Egyptians was highly ceremonial in nature. The different types of mummification took into account the social level and richness of the deceased and even included animals. The most expensive was that reserved for the pharaoh and the royal family, as well as some of the wealthiest members of the court. The first step was cleaning. Once bodies arrived at the mummification site, they were placed on inclined tables while the bodily fluids drained away. They were then cleansed by priests until they were deemed ready for the purification process. The purification of the body began with a libation from sacred water. The priest then fumigated the body with terebinth resin. After the ritual cleansing, priests used oils, spices, and all kinds of essences to further purify the body of the deceased. Finally, all body hair was meticulously removed. Once the body was properly purified, embalmers removed the organs, following very specific procedures. First, the brain was extracted by inserting a spoon through the nostril to break the ethmoid bone. Then, using a spatula, the pieces of the brain were removed as thoroughly as possible. What matter remained was extracted after a process of liquefaction, achieved through the use of a caustic liquid. The cranial box, once emptied, was rinsed and disinfected with palm wine, and then stuffed with strips of linen cloth and liquefied resin. After taking care of the brain, embalmers made an incision on the left flank and carefully set aside the viscera. The inside of the body was also rinsed with palm wine. Then the embalmers filled the belly with pure myrrh, cinnamon, and other perfumes and sewed it shut. The removed viscera were washed in palm wine and packed in crushed herbs before being placed in canopic jars. Canopic jars were placed close to the sarcophagus or kept in a chest nearby. At first, the viscera were wrapped in tissue and placed in the vases. As the ritual requirements became more elaborate, ointments, spices, and even water and natron were added to the process. Towards the middle of the New Kingdom, Canopic jars assumed the appearance of the four sons of Horus. They were known as the protectors of the viscera. These protectors had their own guardians, each a goddess of the dead. Imseti, the human-headed god, protected the liver and was protected by the goddess Iset. Happy, the baboon-headed god, protected the lungs and was protected by the goddess Nephthys. Dumuthef, the jackal-headed god, protected the stomach and was protected by the goddess Neith. And finally, Kebisenuef, the falcon-headed god, protected the intestines and was protected by the goddess Selket. Natron is a naturally occurring mineral found in evaporite. These sedimentary rocks are made up of mineral salts and were generally mined from lake beds in Egypt. Embalmers used natron as a desiccant to dry the flesh and stop the corpse's putrefaction process. Once the body was cleansed and eviscerated, the deceased was covered in natron for about 40 days. Once desiccated, the body was prepared to be wrapped in strips of linen. Once the body was fully desiccated by the natron treatment, embalmers oiled, painted, and sometimes even added hair extensions or a wig. They often used a henna-based antiseptic preparation to give the body a more colorful and lively appearance while preparing it to resist molds and fungi. Next came the phase which gave mummies their most well-known appearance, the wrapping. Originally, each part of the body was wrapped separately. Men had their arms crossed on their chests, while women had the right arm folded over their breasts and the left arm stretched along the body. However, techniques evolved over time. Eventually, the body as a whole was wrapped with limbs alongside the body, and increasingly sophisticated and different techniques of weaving flax bands were developed. In addition to the jewelry and amulets arranged on the skin of the deceased, amulets were also carefully inserted into the weaving of the linen strips. Each amulet was linked to a myth, or to an ideological belief related to rebirth. Masks were an important part of a mummy's finery. Early wooden funeral coverings were very expensive, however, and soon replaced by masks created through a technique known as cartonage. 
Masks fashioned with this method were created by laying several layers of linen or papyrus pulp on a base made of mud or straw. Cartonage was used for more than funerary masks. Ornaments and the animal coffins of the late period were also made in such a fashion. Cartonage evolved to cover the entire body of the mummy during the 22nd dynasty. The mummies were placed on a board inside a rigid envelope of cartonage, which was laced at the back with a string. Extremely cost-effective and visually pleasing, this technique was very popular through all layers of the society. Cartonage envelopes were usually covered with inscriptions and polychrome decorations, specifying the names and titles of the deceased, scenes depicting daily life, or decorations specific to the funerary world. This was a true gift for Egyptologists eager to study the funerary rites of the ancient Egyptians. Once the mummy was properly wrapped and adorned, the embalmers proceeded with the ceremony of the opening of the mouth. A vital step of the funerary process, this ceremony was meant to bring back to life the deceased themselves or an object representing the deceased. There were no less than 75 different stages for the opening of the mouth. It required the application of the same oils, ointments, spices, and perfumes used during the mummification process. Makeup was sometimes part of the process as well. The last stage of this long ritual was the act of touching the mouth with the ads to symbolically allow the breath of life to infuse an inert body. Its performance was reserved for a very specific set of people. Priests who wore the mask of the god Anubis, a close relative of the family, or by the heir to the throne. Natron is a colorless salt that was used by ancient Egyptians for food preservation, cleansing products, and glass making. It was also used in the mummification process. During the ceremonial embalmment ritual, the priests packed the body in natron in order to remove all of the moisture. Once the body was thoroughly desiccated, they could begin the wrapping. Natron was mined in Wadi Natron. The main mining methods involved either cutting slices out of the lake bed when it was dry, or raking through mineral saturated water to gather the mineral salts during the floods. Both techniques are still used today and inspired the team in their recreation of the mines located in the mountains northwest of Memphis. The oldest mummies recovered date from the Old Kingdom, though Egyptologists believe that mummification was in use much earlier than that. At first, the body was mummified through environmental desiccation by leveraging the dryness of the environment and the heat of the climate. Early experimentations in mummification were conducted with the use of resin made from tree sap. Strips of linen were only used on some superficial parts of the epidermis of the hands or jaw. Ideologically, the will to preserve the body is not explained in any way until 3600 BCE. This is when the Egyptian belief that the body housed the soul was finally documented for modern Egyptologists to eventually decipher. It was not until the arrival of the myth of Osiris in the Egyptian religion around the 5th dynasty that mummification was thoroughly conceptualized. The practice was thereafter grounded in both a mythological and ideological point of view. Osiris was mainly known as the god of the dead and the god of resurrection. The most well-known Genesis myth concerning Osiris is that of his dismemberment. It is Plutarch who gives the most simplified and complete summary of the story. Within Egyptian mythology, Osiris represented the first king to rule Egypt. Jealous of his power, his brother Seth attempted to usurp his throne. After several unsuccessful attempts, Seth succeeded in killing his brother by dismembering him and scattering the pieces of his body all over Egypt. Iset, the great of magic, traveled all over Egypt in search of the pieces of her husband's body. After a long search, she recovered all the pieces save for his manhood, as it was eaten by a fish. 
Iset then reassembled the body of her husband by binding it together with strips of linen. Aided by her sister Nephthys, another powerful magician, they gave Osiris the breath of life. This not only brought him back from the dead, but also allowed him to recover his virility long enough to impregnate Iset, thus ensuring his succession before, once more, dying. Thus Horus was born. The ritual used to bring Osiris back to life essentially depicts how he became the first mummy. It is why, on the sarcophagi of kings, we often find Iset and Nephthys represented as the magicians who restore life to the deceased. The first hieroglyph for embalmer appeared in pyramid texts of the Old Kingdom. It is likely that embalming was a trade that progressed alongside the evolution of ancient Egyptian funeral practices. While we still know nothing of how embalming came to be a profession, we do know that embalmers had a hierarchy and that each embalmer specialized in a specific phase of the mummification process. The mummification techniques were jealously guarded by embalmers from generation to generation. Despite their efforts, Herodotus and Diodorus discovered their methods in late antiquity, but historians were skeptical about the validity of the texts. It remained a mystery until two teams of modern medical legal scientists confirmed the process in 1994 and again in 2011. The Uabet, meaning the pure place, was where the embalmers mummified the bodies of the deceased. Until the end of the Middle Kingdom, it was located in tents at the edges of the city due to the smell of decomposition. In the New Kingdom, however, the Uabet was located within the city limits, though still in open-air spaces. In the same way that the practices and techniques of mummification evolved, so possibly did consideration towards embalmers within ancient Egyptian society. The pharaoh had access to the most elaborate of mummification rituals. The richer citizens of Egypt also enjoyed complex embalming options, though none of them allowed for the removal of the brain or viscera. After purifying the body, embalmers injected a liquid through the rectum, sealed it, and allowed the mixture to settle. They then plunged the body into natron for up to 40 days. Once the body was dried, the seal was removed, and the entrails flowed out with the injected liquid, leaving the skin and bones of the deceased to be wrapped in linen and returned to the family for burial. The least costly embalming option was for the embalmers to simply inject a product called surmaya and immerse the body in the natron for up to 40 days before handing it over to the family. For all those who could not afford any embalming process, desert burials offered a pauper's alternative to preserve the bodies of the dead. Egyptian civilization has always appealed to Westerners, even before the Greek and Roman invasions. As early as the Middle Ages, mummies discovered by travelers were often sent back to Europe. Curio cabinets, dating from the 16th and 17th centuries, usually included pharaonic artifacts in their collections. The Egyptomania phenomenon was heralded by Napoleon Bonaparte's Egyptian campaign, which lasted from 1798 to 1802. The following years were marked by a resurgence of interest from rich enthusiasts and scholars who exposed Egypt to the general populace. Many research societies focusing on Egyptology were founded during those years. By 1868, mass tourism began in Egypt under the aegis of the Cook Agency. The rich would indulge in leisure trips to Egypt and bring back mummies. Upon their return, they would organize evenings that consisted of unpacking mummies and removing strips of linen and amulets layer by layer. These were considered the shining cultural events of the season. The Egyptian collections of many a museum were founded as a consequence of this mass pillaging. Thanks to those dubious parties, the fantasy of a mummy coming back to life, seeking revenge on its defilers, was born. 
The mummy malediction myth has remained steady in popular culture ever since, particularly in written media and cinema. Ancient Egyptians believed the world was a chaotic place, filled with supernatural forces. They knew that art and words gave life and power to things. Carved with images from hieroglyphs or in the shapes of gods, amulets were highly personal objects that warded off dangers and disease while attracting success. Some amulets were temporary, intended to solve a specific problem, while others were meant to be worn forever into the afterlife. Priests would infuse amulets with magical energy during religious ceremonies, imbuing them with protective magic to safeguard against supernatural powers. The wealthiest of Egyptians could obtain a divinely ordained pendant in which was hidden a magic formula inscribed on a piece of papyrus. It would act as a unique spell tailored to the owner. Religion was so important to ancient Egyptians that it permeated every aspect of their daily lives. Since water was the source of life and had the symbolism of purifying the body and the soul, all daily routines began with ablutions. Personal prayers to the gods were sometimes written or spoken, with family prayers passed down through generations. There was a complete calendar of each of the religious days, both good and bad, illustrating the appropriate daily rituals. Along with wine, milk, and ointments, offerings to the gods consisted of small amulets to life-size statues and family shrines. During the Greco-Roman period, offerings to the gods consisted of mummified animals, cats for Bostet, dogs for Anubis, and birds for Thoth. Deemed messengers of the gods, oracles offered guidance and judgment for all Egyptians, regardless of status. Crucial advice was offered on everything from day-to-day -day farming management to a pharaoh's decision on whether to start a war. Oracles were often used to decide legal issues. If the accused refused the judgment of the god, another god could be consulted in hopes of a more favorable reply. It was oracles that guided the Greek sailor Batos to the coast of Libya, where he founded a colony known as Cyrene. During Alexander the Great's campaign to conquer Persia, he consulted the oracle at the temple of Amun within the oasis of Siwa, and was subsequently ordained a divine being. From its foundation, the city of Memphis favored worship of the god Ta. The main temple of Ta was known as Hutkapta, meaning palace of the Ka of Ta. The name of the temple, translated into Greek as Egyptos, would eventually evolve into the modern name Egypt. Temples were the center of religious, political, and economic life in ancient Egypt. These sacred places were viewed as the literal home of the gods and goddesses. As such, every aspect of them required care and reverence, all of which was accomplished through elaborate ritual. Located in the center of Memphis, the Temple of Ta was the most prominent and imposing building in the city. The long walkway leading toward the temple, known as the Dromos, was guarded by rows of sphinxes. The entire sacred area was designed to keep the statue of the god protected deep within the sacred enclosures that surrounded it. The Dromos opened into a courtyard with the surrounding portico graced with columns carved to resemble palm trees. During special festivals, the general population was allowed to enter this location but under no circumstances would they be allowed into the sacred spaces beyond the courtyard. The Memphis Alabaster Sphinx was discovered in 1912, almost completely buried in water and sand. Eight meters in height and weighing in at roughly 90 tons, it is still mounted on its original pedestal. Though it is called the Alabaster Sphinx, it was in fact carved from common calcite rock which is similar in appearance and texture to alabaster. Erosion has destroyed the original engravings, 
making it difficult to determine when it was created. Egyptologists believe that its facial likeness resembles Amenhotep II, and so it could have been sculpted somewhere between 1700 and 1400 BCE. It is believed that this monument once stood outside of the Temple of Ta and was integrated into subsequent extensions to the complex. The size of the imposing sculpture reflects the importance it had to the temple during the New Kingdom. This sphinx is one of the few remaining artifacts from the ruins of Memphis to survive. In Egyptian culture, some animals were associated with gods, while others were considered to be living gods. The Apis bull was believed to be a divine entity. The earliest mention of the Apis bull in ancient Egypt goes back as far as the first Egyptian dynasty. Originally the symbol of fertility, the Apis bull was linked to the god Ra, with the image of the sun carried between its horns. Later it was associated with Osiris, the ruler of the underworld, thus becoming the funerary divinity Osorapis. During the 18th dynasty in Memphis, the Apis bull's association with the city's deity earned it the title Herald of Ta. The Apis bull was so revered that even Alexander the Great, upon his arrival in Memphis, gave honor to Apis. The Apis bull lived with its harem in a sacred barn located in an enclosure in the Temple of Ta. Each bull bore 29 signs representative of its divinity. Among them, the bull had an eagle-shaped mark on its back, a double tail hair, and a scarab-shaped mark under the tongue. The signs were intended to correspond with the lunar cycle. After its death, Egyptians would search for its reincarnated form among the livestock. Like other living divinities, the mortal incarnation of the Apis bull was prayed to, and when it died, it was given a luxurious funeral, which included mummification. Until the reign of Ramses II, the Apis bulls were buried in individual graves in Saqqara. During the 26th dynasty, the bodies of the bulls were buried in enormous stone vats in the underground corridors of the Serapium of Memphis. Ancient Egyptians believed that temple rituals were essential to maintain order in the cosmos and allow communication between humans and gods. The pharaoh was required to bring offerings as part of a twofold promise made to the gods to remain a just ruler and to prevent chaos from entering Egypt. Details of the ceremonies found on temple walls provide a thorough overview of the stages of the daily ritual. Performed three times a day to mirror human mealtimes, each step of the highly symbolic ceremony was accompanied by specific recitations, many of which referred to mythical events. The high priest would first awaken the sleeping god with a chant. Then the seals of the shrine's doors were broken and the bolts drawn back. The act of swinging open the doors was a symbolic gesture where sight was granted to the deity. The priest would then bow and kiss the ground. The god was then washed with incense-infused water and its mouth rinsed with mineral salts. The cleansing was followed by adorning the statue with jewels and royal garments. The final ritual required the priest to sweep away any footprints in order to prevent evil from approaching the god. Heredity was the primary source of new recruits. Rarely was an outsider allowed this position. At the top of the temple hierarchy was the high priest. Each temple dedicated to a god had at least one high priest devoted to its care and service. During the Ptolemaic dynasty, one family held the position of high priest in Memphis for almost 300 years. High priest candidates made their way up the ranks of the temple hierarchy. The one chosen to occupy the lofty position of high priest was usually confirmed by the pharaoh. Several of the high priests were also important officials in the government. Families sharing the highest priesthood titles tended to make many alliances 
thereby gaining more land and wealth. Shifting balances of power sometimes resulted in more or less open conflicts between the priesthood and the pharaohs. In the 21st dynasty, Thebes became the capital of an almost entirely theocratic government. The city was headed by king priests who spoke and governed in the name of the god Amun, in open opposition to the ruling pharaohs. These king priests caused a massive decentralization of power known as the Third Intermediate Period. The educational institution in ancient Egypt was known as the House of Life. Attended by the offspring of the elite and the clergy, it was a place tailored to the social status of its attendees. The earliest references to this type of institution date back to royal decrees of the Old Kingdom. Only two known centers have been uncovered, one in the abandoned city of Akhetaten and one at the temple of Ramses II on the west bank of Thebes. Inscriptions uncovered in those locations mention the names and titles of people who were connected with the House of Life, such as a chief physician and many scribes. It is presumed that by the late kingdom, every temple had a House of Life. The House of Life offered training for the elite destined for occupations such as astronomers, doctors, veterinarians, diplomats, architects, translators, or theologians. Some institutions focused on specific disciplines, making them a central hub for the country. Not limited to instruction for young students, the House of Life was a source of reference for many scholars with rooms dedicated to papyri of many disciplines. Because papyri were preserved there, the Greco-Romans referred to the House of Life as a library. Ancient Egyptian economy was based on an unequal system of redistribution of goods. The state of Egypt collected the crops and the temples distributed them throughout the provinces. Since the only people capable of counting and ensuring a fair redistribution were the educated scribes, this meant that the temples played a pivotal role in this process. There are records of pharaohs making offerings of large tracts of land and animals to temples in order to maintain their favor. Ramses III offered generous gifts to the temple of Amun in Karnak in such a manner. Palaces, warehouses, and granaries were built inside the temple compound to better control the redistribution of goods. The size of the recorded numbers of goods, combined with every other function filled by temples, only serves to confirm their might as economic, religious, and political centers of power within Egypt. 